Hi, Todd, and welcome to the 42 Courses podcast. We are thrilled to have you. How are you? I am well, Zaz. It's great to be here. And uh, I see that we both wore the, the uh, was yes. it, uh, black, right? Like, I think we both got the wardrobe memo today. So, yeah, so I'm excited course, to chat yes. with you today. The Steve Jobs uniform saves time, um, for sure. Well, for everyone who doesn't know, uh, we have Todd Henry with us, who is um, a fantastic author, uh, but I'm I'm going to introduce him by his uh, cooler name as the arms dealer for the creative revolution. Todd is an acclaimed author, international speaker, consultant, advisor, all of those good things, um, who has basically dedicated his career to helping creative professionals excel in their work. He's concerned with helping creatives be brilliant, prolific, and healthy, and we're going to dive into these topics a little bit more. He's authored books like The Accidental Creative, Herding Tigers, The Brave Habit, seven books, no less than seven books we have the author of in front of us, who, and that clearly shows that you um, you don't, it's not, all, it's not all words, you actually practice what you preach in terms of being brilliant, prolific, and healthy. So I'm very excited to dive into this, Todd. Um, do you have any opening thoughts for us? I think that that was a wonderful introduction. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know what I could add to that other than um, you know, my heart, as you mentioned, is really for what I call create on demand professionals. So people who have to go to work, solve problems under pressure, um, deliver under often unrealistic deadlines with probably fewer resources than they really need to get the work done. Um, that's really where my heart is. And that's really what I've dedicated my life to understanding uh, and helping people just, if nothing else, put some terminology to some of the things they're experiencing and hopefully be able to have some meaningful conversations about how to not just the work, but how we do the work, which is something we often don't discuss. You know, we talk about the work, but we don't talk about how we do the work, which is really important for creative professionals. Absolutely. Um, to give you a little bit of context about why I, in particular, am excited to be chatting to you is, well, so for, for 42 Courses, which is our um, e-learning platform for professional development, most of our learners happen to be creatives, or at least people who need to solve problems in a professional environment. So this kind, these kinds of conversations are very relevant to them. But on a personal level, I read The Accidental Creative as one of the first few books I read when I was studying advertising at college. Uh, back in the day. And I, I found the accidental creative to be so like a, a gleaming beacon of clarity on how to think about like the creative lifestyle, how to go about it. Um, and of course, since then, you've written so many other books. Uh, so my first question to you, Todd, is really about um, this career you've built uh, about helping creatives do what they do effectively. It's, it's so wonderfully laser focused. Did it start out that way? Did it start from a passion? How did you so effectively it, it, it orientate did, your actually, career in this way? Uh, so my uh, my background is as creative director. So I worked with a lot of um, creative pros who had to deliver on demand every day. And as a, somebody who was trying to lead that team, I discovered that there are woefully few resources for us, especially this was back in the early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s, right? So we didn't have access to podcasts and YouTube and, you know, internet and even books really weren't being written to, they were being written more to a broad audience. There weren't really books being written to that specific need. And so I started asking some of my creative director friends, hey, how do you keep your team engaged? How do you keep them from burning out? And they looked at me like I had three eyes. This, what, do you, what do you mean? We just, we just burn through them and bring in the next crop of creative pros, right? Because <laughs> there are always people waiting outside the door. We're a great company. Why would they not be? And I thought, well, that doesn't seem right to me. And so I started trying to figure out some things that might work, discovered some of the best practices that some of the creative pros out there who had not just been in the industry for three or four years and said, okay, this is the path, but who had been around for 15, 20, 30 years and had been able to sustain a career over a long period, started figuring out some of the core practices that they implement. And we started experimenting and it worked. And so I started a podcast in 2005, really late to the game, this podcast in 2005, and, and really wanted to start a conversation for people like me who didn't really have a lot of resources. And so I called it the accidental creative. And then uh, that podcast quickly gained traction. And a few years later was offered a book deal with Penguin Random House because the book was really, or the podcast was gaining traction. And that was what led to the accidental creative in 2011. So really at the very, very beginning of my 
writing and, and teaching and training career, it was born out of a need that I felt that wasn't being served. And really, I, I would almost say, ironically, is still, I think, not being served terribly well today. I mean, there are more resources for, for certain, but the unique intricacies and dynamics of creating on demand are often something we don't talk about. You know, we love to apply 50 year old management practices to this new kind of work that we're doing. And it just doesn't overlay perfectly. And so I think that's some of the tension that we feel as creative pros is, you know, do people really understand me? Do they understand what it takes to do the work that I do? And um, why am I measuring time when I'm being compensated for value? And, you know, all of these kind of things that we often don't talk about, but they're really important because these are felt needs that we have as creative pros. For sure. It's it's a bit strange working as a creative in this knowledge economy when you're measured on things like um, time and productivity. Um, it's, a, it's a strange one when, when it's your ideas and the execution of those ideas that actually matters so much. So I'd just like to clarify for, for some of our listeners uh, who maybe haven't read the book, uh, we'll start with Accidental Creative and then expand a bit on, on your other works. Um, do you want to give us like a, a, a summary of Accidental Creative or shall I? <laughs> I'm happy to. Yeah. So, okay, thank you. Uh, so the book, The Accidental Creative is primarily targeted at helping creative professionals, which by the way, when we say that word creative, sometimes people self-select out of that. They think, well, I don't make mm. art. I don't paint. I don't write music. I don't you know, make films. Those are certainly creative acts, but really those are more like artistic acts. When mm. I say creative, what I mean is anybody who has to solve problems under pressure every day, which is most of us who work with our minds. And so I believe that the aim for creative pros should be to be three things at the same time, prolific, brilliant, and healthy, meaning we're doing a lot of work. We're doing good work because we have to do that and that we're doing it in a healthy and sustainable way. Um, unfortunately, there's some enemies that we encounter along the way. I call these the assassins and the assassins are things like dissonance, which is a gap between the why and the what of our work, uh, fear, which can be fear of failure or fear of success. Why would we fear success? Well, because what happens Zah, when you over deliver on a project, are your expectations going to go right back down to where they were last time? No, of course not. Now no. your expectations are <laughs> elevated to, I mean, once somebody realizes you can do something that becomes the baseline expectation, it doesn't matter if it took you nights and weekends and you know, whatever to do yeah. it. So, you know, that's a kind of fear that can inhibit our, our work. And then what I call expectation escalation, which is when we are constantly comparing our in process work with the absolute best thing that's ever been done in the history of humanity in our field. And so it paralyzes us because we're comparing our, you know, first draft with the finished draft of one of the masters of our craft. Right. And so we become paralyzed. Yeah. And so, um, those are some of the assassins, but then what I, what I write about in the actual creative is that there are five key areas where we need to build practices in our life to prepare us for the moments when we need to be brilliant. You know, most young creative pros like to coast on their talent and they are talented <laughs> and they think that talent will carry them through. And if, you know, if I just keep winging it and relying on my talent, I'm going to get through. And then yeah. they hit a wall at some point, maybe five, seven, 10 years into their career where they realize talent alone isn't going to get me where I want to go. The people yeah. who sustain are those who build practices in their life. So there are five key areas. The first is focus, which is how we allocate our finite attention. Um, our, we do have finite attention. Most of us don't think we do, but we have finite attention to spend on behalf of the important work that we, that we do every day. The second area is relationships. We need others in order to see ourselves fully and to understand where the real value is in what we do. You know, we, we may think something is valuable, but we really need other people to speak into us and help us understand what we're uniquely capable of. And we also need others to help us stay inspired and in mind around what, what matters. The third area is energy. Uh, we love to talk about time management, but time management is one facet, uh, of our engagement. The, uh, perhaps a more important facet is energy management. We need to cultivate the ability to bring what Lewis Hyde calls emotional labor to our work. And that's, what's different about creative work. You know, it's not just, we're not just cranking out widgets. We have to put something of ourself into the work, our intuition, uh, our sense of identity of who we are. I mean, all of that goes into our work. Well, that requires emotional labor. It requires energy. It does. Yes. And, but we often don't, 
think about that. And so we stack meeting after meeting after obligation after obligation. And then we have 10 minutes to crank out something that's going to wow our client, right? Well, we don't have the energy yeah. we need to be able to do this. So we have to manage our energy effectively. The fourth area is stimuli. These are the bits of stimulus that come into our head that form our creative process. Steve Jobs once famously quipped that creativity is just connecting things. And that's largely true. We need to uh, make sure that we're putting high quality stimulus into our minds so that we get high quality throughput. And then the final area is ours. Ours is about how we manage our time. Time is a currency of productivity, but we often think about, I mean, think about how many times, Zal, you've, you've heard people say, I spend my time doing this, or I'm going to spend some time doing, right? We talk about it as if it's something to be spent. We rarely mm -hmm. think about it as something to be invested. How are you like investing? Asset. Yes, exactly. Like an asset class, right? Like you, you should have a portfolio of things you're investing time in that may not pay off now, but could potentially pay off later. Things like investing time in generating ideas may not pay off now, but you know, it, you could come up with an idea after three or four hours that you yeah. know completely changes the game for you or your organization. So those are the five areas, focus, relationships, energy, stimuli, hours. That's how we begin to uh, counterman some. So that was the entire book of the Axel Creative in about seven minutes. Yeah. Sorry, it took me so long. Yeah. It's a lot of content to cover. So, no, I, I think it's brilliant. And there, there are some aspects of the book that I've, you know, you, we hear about a lot of principles of creativity and even um, how to how to be productive in, you know, in this knowledge economy. But there are some aspects in the book that I've never heard otherwise, um, like, you know, the idea of if you have a long day of meetings or if you have something stressful at the end of the day, create some buffer time. Uh, before you need to go home to your family. So you can show up in that situation being fresh and emotionally available and, and whatever you need. And the other aspect that I loved from the book was a stimulation cue. I mean, everybody's books they want to read, shows they want to watch, things they want to do. But if you frame it in your own mind, like a stimulation cue, it frames it like uh, things that you are putting into your mind that you can later use in your own creative work. Because as you said, Steve Jobs, about connecting the dots, creativity is pattern recognition and what, you know, what, what goes in comes out in some way or another. Any creative knows this, any creative can see with the ideas they come up with. It's usually some version of the things they've recently been exposed to. So if you take the time to, to think about what, what you're putting into your mind uh, so that you get high quality ideas and work out. So exactly as you said at the beginning of this, of this call, your work has been a lot around giving words, giving terms, giving a framing to the processes that, that, are, that creatives need to do high quality work. And I, I think that's fantastic. So, I mean, we love the accidental creative. Your well, one of the other book, things yes? also. Please go ahead. I was, I'm sorry to interrupt. I was going to say one of the other elements that is really, really important for creative professionals is we, we fail to realize that our most valuable asset, what we bring to the table that nobody else can is our intuition. And that intuition has to be honed and it has to be protected. Many, especially leaders, but I would say creative pros in general, don't even know what's on their mind because they don't have space in their life to pause and reflect and allow their thoughts to synthesize. And so when we talk about practices in our lives, one of them the critical realizations we have to have is that we must do whatever it takes for us to protect our intuition, to protect our ability to synthesize, to connect dots. And you know, you just mentioned the thing about your creativity is pattern recognition. There are patterns all around us um, that we don't even see because we're so busy bouncing from thing to thing that we don't take the time to stop and to look for patterns and to synthesize. And you know that's one of the unique things that creative pros bring to the table that we have to protect at all costs. With regard, part of that is you know with regard to stimuli, what informs our creative process. You know, most people when they when they hear that, when they think about it, what they think is, oh, I'm going to go out and look at you know, 200 other pieces of work that are just like the kind of thing I'm trying to do today. And that's not what I'm telling people to do. Instead, we have to absorb high quality stimuli and then think about it and process it 
and allow it to transform our mind, allow it to transform how we see our own work and our own role in the world. You know, there are some tools now that will deliver the the top five insights from any book that you want to read, right? As if the goal of reading is just to get five bullet points from a book or from a piece of work, but that's that's not the value of reading. The value of reading is how it transforms your mind as you're in the process of reading, how it coalesces your own thoughts, how it distills patterns in your own mind, how you begin to think differently and respond differently because of the empathy that's built through the process of reading, of absorbing the great ideas of other people. And so it's not just about the stimulus itself. It's about how you interact with the stimulus and what that provokes and transforms inside of you as you're absorbing it. So I, I just, I want to make sure that I'm not sending the wrong message to people that, Hey, you should go out and just look at 500 ad placements that are exactly like what you're trying to, you know, that's not, I mean, that can be valuable. Certainly. Um, competitive comparative analysis can certainly be valuable, but really when it comes to you and your process and protecting your intuition, it's really more about making sure that you're dedicating blocks of time to allow your mind to be transformed by the world around mm. you. And that's how we become great artists. That's how we become great creative pros. And we don't become reductive yeah. and just rep replicative of everything else in our environment. That, that is amazing insight that I uh, thank you for adding that to, to your work. Um, I love the idea of honing your intuition because at the end of the day, that's what you as an individual have to offer to your team. Do you have any uh, stories or anecdotes about ways to like specific ways to hone your intuition? I mean, creative directors often like to tell their teams, go to a museum, go to an art gallery. Um, are there any interesting experiences right. that you would like recommend to people that has changed the way that they ideate or generate solutions. Yeah. I mean, I'll give you some examples of another practice that I recommend in the book. And I've, I've had many leaders who have implemented this. Um, it's something that I call in the book. I think I call it unnecessary creating in the axiom creative. I've taken to calling it back burner creating um, because I don't think it's unnecessary. Uh, it was <laughs> sort of what I meant was it's not on demand, right? When I said unnecessary, yes. but my question would be for people who create for a living, do you only ever create when somebody's looking over your shoulder, when somebody is paying you, when somebody is judging your creativity, or do you have any area of your life where you are creating simply because you love to create, you're developing new skills, you're taking risks, you're trying things, you're giving yourself the space to create for the sheer love of creating. And I bring that up because I've had several leaders, artists, and others who have reached out to me or who I've worked with directly, who have, you know, uh, creative directors who take up watercolors as a, a way to sort of break away from the pressure of their work and just experiment with their creating again. Um, I've had leaders who have taken up gardening uh, as a way to sort of break away from the pressures. Um, I have one uh, person I know of who uh, is a music producer and a, and a writer who took up woodworking as a way to sort of engage in unnecessary creating because it's something other than the core thing that they're responsible for. And, and here's what happens to us. There's a, there's a great principle called the breakout principle. A guy named Herbert Benson wrote a book called the breakout principle. And when we're deeply immersed in our work for a long period of time, we become an expert at our work and we're deeply immersed in the problem. And then we break away and we go do something else that engages a different part of our mind. It's incredible what comes to the surface when we're, when we're away from the work, you know, we allow yes. our mind to do the thing that it does best, which is to synthesize and form patterns and solve problems. I mean, our minds are wired. Our minds are not wired to do projects. Our minds are wired to solve problems, <laughs> right? So once we yes. immerse our mind in the problem and then we break away and we allow our minds to synthesize, it's incredible what will often come to the surface that we least expect. So building that space, just like I was talking about building space into our life for reading and absorbing stimulus, building space into your life to go and experiment and try things and create when you're not on the clock can open up those same pathways to intuition. Um, when you're doing something that seems remarkably disconnected from the core of your work, right? And yet that's often what creates the space for ideas to rise at the surface for intuition to grow. So. That would be an example of a couple of stories, I think, of people who have done that. Um, 
And what they've discovered on the other side is it made them more effective in their day-to-day -day work. Uh, it made them, you know, gave them better ideas on demand because they were creating space. So the, the, here's kind of, I guess, the summary, the dirty little secret is this. If you want to be brilliant in the moment's notice, you have to begin far upstream from the moment you need a brilliant idea. You have to build yes. practices that prepare you to carve out space in your life, that prepare you for those moments so that you can spot patterns when you need to spot them the most. Yes. Um, in one of your recent podcasts, there's a discussion on, I think it was called chaos theory. And, you know, you discussed the, the concept of mm -hmm. luck and, you know, our principles really all they match up to be or, you know, in life do things just happen. But the message seems to be the more prepared you are to be brilliant at a moment's notice, the more luck seems to wink in your favor. Um, so yes, it's absolutely about preparing yourself to be brilliant by putting in the, in the work and the practice and exposing yourself to lots, lots of stimuli. I do want to continue talking about um, your intuition because it, um, your next book, I think, it would Die Empty, um, continues this sort of personal development um, about honing your own intuition and sort of uh, taking it with both hands and taking your intuition and what you have to offer the world into into your work. Do you want to talk about Die Empty a little bit? As it seems to me to be um, an expansion on the accidental creative in terms of stepping into your own power as a creative. Over to you. It very much is. And, and, and that, you know, it's interesting that my books have sort of led one into the other. Um, and mm. this story about Die Empty was uh, the last story that I told in The Accidental Creative. And then it led to the next book. Part of it was I didn't know if I was going to ever write another book. And so I wanted to cram everything into The Accidental Creative. But then it sort of <laughs> led into the next book. And really what Die Empty is about is there are, listen, okay, so The Accidental Creative is about organizing your world and preparing yourself to do work um, to be able to deliver on your objectives. But that raises a really interesting question, which is like, are you doing work that really matters? Are you doing the work that really uh, resonates yeah. with you? Or are you, are you settling into mediocrity? And that word mediocrity comes from two words in the original language, medius meaning middle and ochrus meaning rugged mountain. So to be mediocre means to stop halfway up a rugged mountain, to get halfway to your objective oh. and say, eh, close enough, right? Did you settle in? <laughs> And so many talented creative pros and leaders, I find settle medias ochres. They, they choose to settle halfway to their potential, halfway to their capabilities. Um, and, and frankly, a lot of us look at those people and think that they're excellent because they're so talented, but their ceiling is so high. Only mm -hmm. they know that they've settled in. Only they know that they're they're settling into a place of comfort that they've, they've settled media socrates. So there are seven core forces that I discovered that cause talented people to settle um, their aimlessness, which is when we become disconnected from our through line or our productive passion, the thing that we're spending ourselves on behalf of busy boredom, which is when we stop asking questions, we stop seeking truth. Instead, we just settle around a set of facts that reinforce what we want to believe. And we just lather, rinse, repeat, right? Comfort is when we stop innovating, we stop growing. It's when we settle into a place of stasis, when we've become known for a thing, which sounds wonderful. Mm. Isn't that what most of us aspire to as creative pros, to become known for a thing? And then everything in our life becomes about protecting that thing instead of continuing to grow. So that's comfort. Delusion is when we settle into a place of uh, believing false narratives or false beliefs about ourselves and our career. Uh, for example, I had a, a great conversation with Richard Heitner, who used to be the global vice chair of Saatchi and Saatchi. And Richard said that he once upon a time aspired to be the CEO of a publicly traded company. It's what he wanted to be. And, and everything in culture was telling him, if you don't aspire to be a CEO, there's something wrong with you, right? And so then he had that opportunity. And what he realized was, I'm actually a really great number two, but I'm not oh. necessarily a great number one. That's not where I thrive. And so he settled into this thing of like, I realized I am great as a, like a COO, right? Aligning objectives and coming alongside the visionary and helping them you know, deliver. But I really, you know, don't thrive in that role of CEO where I'm sort of the one mm. making all the decisions about the direction of the organization. And that's a very brave realization to come to. He, he compiled his thoughts in a book called Conciliary where he talked about like the power of sort of being the person behind the person. Um, 
but that that's an example of a narrative we believe that if you don't aspire to be, you know, somebody high up in the organization, there's something wrong with you. Um, yeah. And so that's an example of how delusion can take us off course as leaders. Um, sort of the false next one assumptions. is ego, which is, yes, exactly, exactly. Or I call them ghost rules, right? Like these invisible huh. narratives that that limit our engagement. The next uh, assassin is ego, which is when we become inflexible because we're protecting ourselves ahead of the productive passion. The next uh -huh. one is fear, which we talked about a little bit in the Axion Creative. And fear is when the perceived consequences of failure outweigh the perceived benefits of success. We don't act. We don't take strategic risk. And then finally, guardedness, which is when we become closed off to other people. We don't have strong relationships in our lives, people speaking truth to us, people inspiring us. So aimlessness, boredom, comfort, delusion, ego, fear, guardedness. In some ways, this is a, an expansion of those assassins concepts that yes. I talked about in the Axion Creative. It's almost like we took those three assassins and kind of blew them out into seven yeah. forces. But really, the book yeah, I see, I see is a lot of similarities. Don't get stuck. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of yeah, similarities. For sure, and for sure. something, and, and some, it, sorry, something you've touched on um, or in the book was. Um, uh, fear of your own ideas in terms of um, you may have a great idea, but you fear mm. what will be involved in making a reality. So you don't push it forward. Um, and that uh, yeah. probably ties into a lot of these seven deadly sins, um, uh, which is a really sad place to be in. So please do tell us how to move past the seven deadly sins and to, to, to be, to meet your full potential as a creative. Yeah. Well, so I would say with, and we probably don't have space to talk about all of them, but let's talk about the one you just mentioned, which is, you know, if you have this fear of insufficiency or the fear of, I mean, we could almost call this has become very popularly summarized in the phrase imposter syndrome, which is uh, a phrase that was originally coined by two researchers to describe something uniquely. And this is something people don't realize was uniquely coined to describe something women feel in the workplace. And now it's sort of been, you know, applied broadly to anyone who ever feels like they don't belong in the room. But yeah. that feeling of imposter syndrome, I think often describes what you're, what you're saying, which is, well, I have an idea, but who am, who am I to bring this idea to the world? Or I have an idea, but you know, what if it costs me more than I'm willing to spend in order to, to get it to where it needs to be? And, and sometimes it's, I don't know necessarily that I, I have the skill or the aptitude or the clarity of vision to be able to make this happen. What we fail to realize is, and Teresa Amabile wrote about this in, in the progress principle, her phenomenal book, what we fail to realize is that nobody knows at the beginning of a big project that they're going to get to where they want to be. And, and also what they think they're navigating toward at the beginning often looks very different from where they end up because they learn as they go, as they try things, as they fail. And so the key to getting beyond that fear is to simply make small bits of progress. Progress builds upon progress, builds upon progress, builds confidence, builds clarity. You learn things, you begin to see the problem through new lenses. You begin to develop your own sense of capability and confidence and agency as you do that. And so, you know, my encouragement to people is some, something might seem way beyond you. And frankly, just to be perfectly clear, it may be way beyond you, but you don't know that yet. You don't know yeah. that if you're just standing there looking at a mountain, you have no idea if you can climb it. Maybe you can get the base camp. Maybe you can get halfway up the mountain, you know, maybe whatever, maybe that's the extent of your capabilities. But as long as you're making slow, steady progress, that's the important thing because that's how we discover who we are, what we're capable of, and our ultimate potential. If you are not failing from time to time, if you're not falling short from time to time, you are not trying sufficiently difficult things. I mean, if, you, if you're just someone who is constantly succeeding at every single thing you do and everybody thinks everything you do is amazing, well, that, that's great, but that probably means that you're, you're falling short. You're probably falling prey to one of these seven deadly sins because it means that you're not trying sufficiently difficult things. You're not growing. You're not developing new aptitudes because you're just doing things that you can succeed at. Some people would rather live with perceived invulnerability than test their limits and discover they actually have some. 
They'd rather just believe I'm great at everything I do, right? Um, none of us are. Yeah. Those who grow and those ultimately who live a gratifying life as a professional are those who are willing to test their limits, those who are willing to discover what their, their true strengths are uh, and where their limitations are because we all have them. We all have blind spots and limitations. And so we need to understand what those are rather than living in that uh, la-la land of you know perceived invulnerability that so many of us want to dwell in. Mostly yeah, because of absolutely. Insecurity. Yes, I mean it's it's funny that you call it la la land because I I know that so many so many of us myself included um, have spent so much time in a sort of rut of feeling ineffective or like my voice is not worth something. I have this idea, but who am I to to bring this forward? Um, and as you say, it seems like the only cure mm. is to to take the risk of looking foolish, to take the risk of trying something and saying you know saying what about this um and you have to realize that the worst that can happen is someone hopefully will just say maybe not but let's try this or you know no and, and when you think about it it's not the end of the world um so i mean you, in your books and in your work you have it's definitely not the end of the um, world lots especially of, if you're being contributive like so many practices and um uh, not tricks but you know uh, uh habits and and exercises and things to try to help people reach their potential, help people step out of ruts like this. Um, there are many, and a lot of people feel quite scared to try something. What would you say is a good starting point? Or have, have you got any stories about people who started putting um, the practices in place and seen effective changes in their life? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I have numerous stories of people that I've worked with, clients I've worked with, um, who have applied these principles. But I'll say, from, from the from the standpoint of starting, there's a there's a principle in Die Empty in the comfort section, the comfort comfort chapter, where I talk about step, sprint, and stretch goals. A stretch goal is a big goal over a long period of time that's going to stretch you in some way. So let's say that you've never you you've never run before and you decide I want to run a half marathon, right? I mean that's a substantial 13 miles is a long way for someone uh, yeah. to run who's never run before. Um a sprint goal means you're going to block you're going to set aside sprints that are going to nest up into that stretch goal. So like for example, the first sprint might be I just want to get to a place where I can run a mile. That's all I want to be able to do. So maybe the first part of that is I'm going to start walking a mile every day. And then after a couple of weeks, I'm going to start jogging for a quarter of that mile. And then I'm going to start, you know, so that would be an example of sprints nesting up into that, that stretch goal. And then the step goal is just the day by day by day by day execution of those sprints. You know, and we're all familiar with sprints because we all now everybody does you know, scrum methodology. And whatever, you know, but that's kind, <laughs> yes. of the, the, kind of the whole, the whole point is like, Basically, those big goals feel so out of reach for us. I want to write a book, right? Well, that that's great, but nobody sits down and writes a book. I don't write books. I write words that become paragraphs, that become pages, that become chapters, that become books. Uh, everybody writes words. That's what we actually write uh, that become books. Same thing for any big goal. And so my encouragement to people who feel a little bit overwhelmed is, okay, what is that stretch goal for you that feels overwhelming? What might it look like to nest some sprints in there that you can measure where you can say, okay, I made progress here. I made progress here. I made progress here. Great. And that's going to ultimately get me where I want to be. Maybe not on time. Maybe your timelines are unrealistic. That's fine. But as long as you're making progress and then what are the steps of those sprints? And then just it's become so cliche now that it's almost overused, but this sort of Jerry Seinfeld, you know, don't break the chain, you know, mark it off on the calendar. You know, he would write jokes every day and he would just, you know, mark it off every day and don't break the chain. That's what your steps are. You know, don't break the chain every single day. Do something that moves you in the direction of your, your stretch goal. That's my, that's my encouragement to people who might feel overwhelmed by these big, ambitious ta big ambitious goals that we have that feel overwhelming to us um you may fail you may fail i'm not making you any promises uh, you know like you said earlier and like we've been addressing a lot on the podcast talent plays a big role i don't know how talented anybody listening is i mean maybe maybe you honestly maybe you don't have the talent to do it or maybe you are the great undiscovered talent of our generation 
who, who knows, right? Maybe you are, but the only way you discover that is by moving forward. And talent is going to play a role. Luck is going to play a role. Life circumstances are going to play a role. All of those things are going to play a role in whether or not you succeed, but it's not about you succeeding. It's about you making progress toward what matters to you. And in the end, even if you don't get to your goal, you're going to get someplace that's deeply meaningful to you because it transformed you as you were in the process of accomplishing it. And so that's my encouragement to people is just don't sit on your hands, make small yeah. bits of progress. Do something, stretch yourself, get out of your comfort zone, explore. Um, yeah, these are all very encouraging things. 100%. Um, I, I would like to share once one very small anecdote for myself. Uh, as I mentioned, I've you know felt at times felt like I've been sitting in a rut of you know who am I to bring forth this idea. I recently came back from an event called Africa Burn. It's like Burning Man, but in Africa, where my friends and I built an artwork out of wood and. I'm no artist, I'm no woodworker. Um, and I was working with engineers and people who definitely know a lot more about this than I do. And yet, because it was not a professional situation, I was with my friends, I, you know, if I saw something being like, wouldn't it be better if we did it that way rather than this way? And actually voiced these concerns, to my utter surprise, they were actually useful. So it gave me a lot of confidence in thinking, you know, my <laughs> ideas, even in something as strange to me as structural engineering maybe maybe i can be useful um so i would encourage people to to try you know take the risk to take the risk of being wrong to to step forward try something for new sure. you might learn something yeah for sure um, that's a great example and 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 also um the the structural engineers who were there they may have been suffering from the curse of expertise where they aren't asking those silly outside questions because <laughs> they are so familiar with the, with the subject matter that they are making assumptions, right? That, uh, and so it takes an outside eye sometimes to step in and suggest something that could be wildly inappropriate, right? But it takes courage to say that. And in your case, it, it was appropriate, right? But sometimes it might not be. And, and in organizations, this is something we also have to sort of, we have to embrace as creative professionals is that we need to speak our observations and our opinions 100%. And permission to speak is not permission to make decisions. That's something we have to internalize. Our job isn't to make the decision. Our job isn't to shape the project in that way necessarily, right? But our job is to speak what we see, to make observations, to make suggestions, and then just to say, okay, I've, I've done my part in it because permission to speak isn't permission to make the decision. There are all kinds of other factors that go into decisions that I may not be aware of, um, but I need to have the courage to at least speak my mind when I see something. Yes. That is such a, a liberating aphorism. Permission to speak is not permission to make decisions. I'm going to take that forward. And for anyone who's listening who who wants to latch onto these ideas, I would highly recommend Todd's most recent book, The Brave Habit. We won't go into that now, but um, it's very much about this, um, you know, bravery in your in your professional life um, for for yourself and your ideas. I'm going to ask you one last question, Todd. You mentioned um, hidden talents. What is what is a, a hidden talent of yours that has not got anything to do with your your work or your professional life? It can be mediocre, it can be astounding. What is a hidden talent of yours? So I spent the first uh, six years of my professional life as a touring musician, actually a singer songwriter, and uh, got to wow. play in front of thousands of people and uh, got to uh, be the opening act for a lot of really like big, big, big name acts. Um, here in the US, Amazing. which was a lot of fun. Um, and and uh, to be completely frank, made no money doing it, right? Because it's just the nature <laughs> of the business, especially when you're an unknown commodity. Yes, of course, in music, um, it's very but tough. I did learn a ton. Absolutely. But I, but I did learn a ton from that process. And it I carry that forward into my my work today. I mean, the fact that I'm comfortable being on stage in front of 10,000 people sharing ideas, right? It, it really largely comes from the fact that at one point in my life, I was walking onto stage to play music for people who did not come to hear me play and were not pleased <laughs> that I was going to be the first act on the stage because nobody loves yes. an act, right? Um, yeah. 
but I had to learn how to win people over. I had to learn how to empathize with people and all those things. And so sometimes the places that we, we need to grow the most come from the least likely experiences in our lives. And that's really, I think what happened to me. So I would say music to answer your question, music, I still <laughs> have two guitars hanging on my office and a mandolin hanging Amazing. on my office walls. And I, uh, still write and record music to this day that nobody will ever hear. But uh, yeah, that's that's probably my. <laughs> that's your talent. what did you call it? Backroom creating. That's my backburner creating. That's exactly back right. That's creating. what I do. And yeah. so it, here, so here's the interesting thing. Like that used to be. I mentioned you know the 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 music producer. You know, for me, music used to be my. That used to be my on demand job. That's what I did. I wrote songs and I played music. Um, wow. And so I had to find other ways of you know, of, of expressing myself, but now writing and teaching and training and building a business and all these things are my on demand work. So now music has become my back burner creating. That's where I go to disconnect and, you know, sort of find expression for myself outside of my work. And that's a great example of how that plays out because it energizes me. It gives me another form of expression. I can make really bad music that nobody will ever hear, you know, and it doesn't matter because nobody's going to judge me. So, I mean, it's a great way to, you know, to have that outlet um, in my life as a, as a creative expression to allow me to grow and take risks. And I think that's my internet saying that we're done. <laughs> but thank you so much, Todd. That that. <laughs> That sounds brilliant. And it's really encouraging to see that your the practices you preach, you actually live in your own life and it, and it works for you. Of course, how could you have a, a, a passion project or a hobby like that that doesn't influence your professional life? Um, it's, it's wonderful to see. Well, I'm just going to say I feel enlightened. I feel privileged to hear your personal insights about your work, which I love. And I haven't read all of your books, but I'm going to because I find it very inspiring and meaningful. Um, and I encourage all of our listeners to do the same. Look up Todd Henry. Um, he has a very, very useful website. It's very neatly organized called toddhenry.com. We have the books, the podcasts, the articles. It, it's, it's so very useful and hands-on. So, Todd, thank you so much for joining us. I've so appreciated this. And I hope you have a wonderful day further. Um, and we'll catch up with you next time. Thank you so much. This has been a, a real pleasure.